Hello Luke, welcome to lesson 62. So today we will be talking about roots. Roots. Okay? And uh, what they are and kind of explore them a little bit. Uh, and we've already been working with square roots for quite a while now and, and you would recognize something that looked like like this perhaps, the square root of 4, right? And you might even recognize that the square root of 4 is going to be equal to 2. All right, but just as a quick review, what do we mean when we say square root? And how do we know that the square root of 4 is equal to 2? All right, well, let's, let's talk about that for a second. So the square root, you could kind of think of the square root um, as the, the opposite of an exponent. That's one way to look at it. So when we have an exponent such as 2 raised to the second, this is our exponent, right? The little number at the top we know that and 2 raised to the second power is going to be 4. Now what if we want to undo what we just did? All right so we took a number we raised it to the second power and we got 4. Well how about if we wanted to you know get back to this number get back to the 2 starting with the 4 now. All right well how would we do that? How do we undo exponents? And the answer is by using uh, square roots, or I should say roots. All right, so if I wanted to undo it, I would start with the 4, okay, and then I would take the square root of 4, and the square root of 4 is 2. So there, I'm right back to this number here. I've come full circle. So I took 2, squared it to get to the 4, and now I square root the 4, and I get back to the 2. Okay, so when we think of square roots, you can think of it as being the opposite of exponents. All right, so with that being said, though, let's, let's talk about it a little bit more in depth than we have before. Up to this point, we've always just said, well, the square root of 4 is 2. You know, the square root of, of uh, 9, what is that? Well, that's 3. Why? Because 3 times 3 is 9, right? 3 to the second power is 9, so the square root of 9 is 3. All right, square root of 25, well, that is 5, and so forth, right? Um, but actually, let's think about this for a second, because if we're asking ourselves, okay, if I have the number 4, what number raised to the second power would give me a 4? And you would say, well, 2 would give me 4. And I would say, yes, you're absolutely right, 2 would give me 4, but isn't there another number that would give me 4 as well if I squared it? And the answer is yes, there is. There is a negative 2, isn't there? If I take 2 and square it, I get 4. If I take a negative 2 and square it, don't I also get 4? Sure. Negative 2 times negative 2 is a positive 4. So 2 certainly is an answer. But it's not the only answer. Negative 2 would also be an answer. Both of those, if I square them, will give me 4. So the fact of the matter is, if you have any positive number, there are actually two square roots to that number. There is a positive square root and there is a negative square root. That is just a fact. All right, so pick any number you want. If you want to pick the square root of, of 8, well, there is a positive answer and there is a negative answer. There are two answers to the square root of 8. Okay, and actually, if you, if you want to know what the answer is, if I kind of round it to the nearest hundredth place, it would be 2.83, positive 2.83 and negative 2.83. Okay. <clears throat> Because both of those, if I square them, I will get an 8. And then over here, this 3. Well, sure, 3 is an answer to the square root of 9. But also, negative 3 is an answer. 5 is an answer to the square root of 25. But negative 5 is also an, an, an answer. And we've never really talked about this much before. We've just always assumed that the answer we're looking for is the positive answer. But in fact, it's very important to recognize that there are actually two answers to these square root problems. 
All right. So with that being said, how are we going to approach this in our textbooks? Because this can totally kind of, you know, rock your world a little bit here now. When you have, you know, um, let's say you have an expression that you're trying to evaluate and it says three plus the square root of four. And you go, oh, okay, well, this is equal to three plus two, but it could also be equal to three plus, you know, a negative two. And these aren't going to give me the same answer. 3 plus 2 is 5, and 3 plus a negative 2 is 1. So which one is the right answer? And up to this point, we've just always said this one's the right answer. Right? We just assumed that the square root of 4 was positive 2. That is a convention that, you're, that most mathematicians actually just accept. So when we see the square root of a number, we just kind of accept the fact that we're looking for the positive root of it even though there is the negative root of it as well all right we just kind of all agree that if we're looking for a root uh in general we're going to be looking for the positive one if for some reason we want the negative one because that's often the case that we might want the negative square root if that's the case then i wouldn't write it like this three plus the square root of four i would write it like three minus the square root of four all right, because in effect, we're, we're kind of forcing our way to that negative uh, answer for the square root of 4. Because if we just assume we're always going for the positive, we'd say the square root of 4 is 2. But then we have this negative out here, and that has to be brought down as well. And then we get this, this negative 2. Okay, so if the textbook wants the negative uh, root of something, they'll put the negative sign out in front of the square root. Otherwise, if it's a positive sign out here, we're just assuming that, well, actually, we're always assuming, I should say, we're always assuming that they want the positive root, okay? And then they will force it to be negative or positive, depending upon they, what they want, by this sign out in front of the root, okay? So, I guess just to be very clear, in your seat work, if you have an expression that you're trying to evaluate, and that expression has a square root in it, then always find the positive root uh, for that square root, okay? That's just the rule that we kind of adopt. But keep in the back of your mind that there are actually two answers. One of them is negative and the other is positive. But we've just agreed that we're always going to look for the positive, okay? All right, so that is just kind of a quick uh, intro, I guess, into... Um, into square roots. Let's let's delve a little bit deeper now and take a look at a couple of others. So let's say I have the square root of, uh, let's say square root of nine, okay? And <clears throat> what happens if I multiply this by itself? So if I multiply the square root of nine times the square root of nine, okay? What's that going to give me? All right. Think about that for a second. What's that going to give me? Well, if you answered 9, you would have been 100% correct. Okay? So, the square root of 9 times the square root of 9 is, in fact, 9. And how do we know that? Well, this one's pretty simple because the square root of 9 happens to be a 3. And again, we're assuming that we're looking for the positive one. So, 3 times the square root of 9 again, which is 3, is going to give us 9. Right? Uh, so, what's interesting to note here is that if you take a square root and multiply it by itself, in fact, all you're doing is removing the square root sign. Okay, so if I have the square root of 25, and I want to multiply that by the square root of 25, the answer is 25. I don't even really have to think about it. All I need to recognize is that it's a root being multiplied by another root that's the same root. And th therefore, all we have to do is just kind of remove, you know, this exponent or the exponent, this radical sign, uh, which, by the way, that's what we call the square root sign is the radical sign. Um, we remove that radical sign and we just get rid of one number and just keep the other. OK, so that's that's how we do it. It kind of just consolidates these two into one number without the radical. Okay, so we could get pretty complicated here and actually do some pretty easy multiplication. So if I had, you know, the square root of 2.43 times 
the square root of 2.43. Now, I don't know what the square root of 2.43 is. I'd have to use a calculator. However, I do know that when I multiply these two, I end up with 2.43. That's my answer. Because again, it's being multiplied by itself, and we just remove the radical sign. Okay? So that's an important concept to recognize because later on when we're dealing with equations, this can be, become really handy. Sometimes we'll even have whole expressions underneath here. So for example, if I have you know, the square root of x plus y plus 4, okay, and, I want, and if I multiply that by a square root of x plus y plus Four. The beautiful thing here is I don't know what x is, I don't know what y is, uh, but I do know what these two square roots multiplied by each other are. They are going to be x plus y plus 4. The radical sign just disappears and everything underneath stays the same. Okay, so that's just very handy to know later on. Okay, very good. Um, let's move on. And let's dissect uh, the root a little bit more here. So let's first just talk about this sign. I already mentioned to you the name for it. So I would say in your math notebook, jot down a few of these definitions here <clears throat> because they will be using them throughout the book and it's nice to know what they're referring to. So this, this sign here that we often just call you know, the root, this, this is called the radical sign radical sign okay and what you might not have known about roots is that there is an invisible number right here in this check mark part of the sign okay just like you know if I have a a number I've been telling you all along that there's an invisible uh, exponent the invisible exponent is a one right um, or if I have a variable there's an invisible coefficient the invisible coefficient is a 1 that sits out here, right? Well, kind of the same thing applies for this. There is an invisible number right in this check mark, okay? And when it's invisible, uh, well, I guess I'll just say the invisible number is 2. So the number that we can't see in here is a 2, okay? This number itself, we give it a name. We call this number the index. Okay, so you've got the radical sign and then you've got the index. All right, and then finally we have the number inside. So we have this number. Okay, this number is called the radicand. So this is the radicand. Okay, so you have the radical sign the radicand, which is the number inside, and then you have the index, the little invisible two outside, inside, well, outside the, the, the kind of um, the radical sign, but inside the little check mark. Okay? <clears throat> now, what's interesting to note here is that it doesn't, this index does not always have to be two. But if we don't want it to be two, we, we have to actually show it. If there isn't any number there, we assume that it's 2. And throughout our course, for the most part, we've been assuming that it's 2. Sometimes I think you've seen a 3 in there. Um, but remember what it means. This 2 is indicating what power we want the number raised to that'll give us a 16. So if I have the square root of 16, and I'm just going to make it invisible, this there, well, maybe I'll make it visible, just so that we're clear. Inside here we have this little 2. Okay, and, and what does this mean? Well, this means what number raised to the second power is going to equal 16. That's, that's really what we're asking here. So we're asking what number raised to the second power is going to be equal to 16. Okay, and then of course the answer for this question mark right here is a 4. A 4 raised to the second power is 16. Um, so uh, the answer then is going to be 4. That's what this question mark turned into. So that's our answer. It equals a 4. Okay. Um, so if this number is not a 2, uh, let's say we have it as a 3. So something like this. 
this could be read as the third root of eight. Okay, the third root of eight. All right, and what does this indicate? Well, this, this indicates that we want something raised to the third power that'll give us eight. And we really want to know what this something is. All right, so if we think about that for a second, we can probably figure it out and recognize that this something would have to be a two, right? Because two raised to the third power is two times two times two, which is in fact eight, which is what we're looking for. So therefore, this, this something is actually a two. So the cubed root or the third root of eight is going to be a two, okay? Now here's the question for you. So this first radical that we had with the invisible two, uh, we talked at the beginning of this lesson about it having two answers. We said, well, positive four is one answer. Another answer is a negative four. It really has, you know, either one of these answers will work. Okay, so my question is, does the cube root of eight also have multiple answers? Or is two the only answer for the cubed root of eight? Why don't you think about that for a second and decide before I tell you. Does it only have one, one solution or does it have more than one solution? Well, the answer is it only has one solution, okay? Because if you were to say, well, maybe it's like the squared and it has a negative two as well. As a, as a root of 8, as a solution to 8. Well, that would mean that negative 2 raised to the third power would have to be equal to 8. And let's think about that. A negative 2 times itself, times a negative 2 is a positive 4. And then a positive 4 times another negative 2 is going to be a negative 8. So in fact, a negative 2 raised to the third power is a negative 8, which does not equal 8. That doesn't work. Okay, so therefore negative 2 is not uh, one of the third roots for 8. So in fact, there is only one solution for the cubed root of 8, which would be a 2 in this case. And I could even expand that to say that in general, if you have the third root of any number, any number you want, stick it in there, there is only going to be one solution one solution. Now you might be tempted to say that this solution has to also uh, be positive, but in fact it doesn't because what's interesting about cubed roots is that we could have a negative number underneath the radical sign. So we could say the cubed root for a negative 8, for example. Okay, So the cubed root of a negative 8 would in fact be a negative 2 for the same reason that we just described it over here. So this negative 2, we raised it to the third power, turned out to be this negative 8. Well, that, in this case, is, is what we wanted, was a negative 8. So here, the solution is a negative 2, and a positive 2 would not work. Positive 2 would give me a positive 8. So here, again, we only have one solution. It's a negative 1 this time, though. So you could have a negative or a positive solution, but you're all, always only going to have one solution when it's the cubed root or the third root. Okay? So hopefully that makes sense. And maybe I should just point out, because we didn't talk about this earlier, uh, could you ever have the square root of, you know, uh, a negative number? So let's say we have the square root of a negative 4. Could we ever find a solution to this? Well, let's, let's think about it. We have this invisible 2 here, so we need some number raised to the second power that's going to give us a negative 4. Okay, and is there a number? Well, I could do a 2, and if I raise that to the second power, that's a positive 4. That doesn't work. If I try a negative 2, that's also a positive 4. And there's no way for me to actually get a negative here, because anytime you know I multiply two positives by each other, I'm going to get a, po a, a positive. If I multiply two negatives by each other, I'm going to get a negative. Uh, excuse me, I'm going to get a positive. And I can't take, you know, a positive 2 and multiply it by a negative 2 because that goes against the very nature of what the radical sign is. Um, the radical sign indicates that we're talking about a single number being multiplied by itself 
And this is not being multiplied by itself. It's being multiplied by the opposite of itself. So that does not work. We can't have a positive times a negative. All right? So there's no way for us to get this negative 4. So the answer, well, let me put it to you this way. The answer at this given point in time in our mathematical um, journey here is going to be no solution. Now, I say that carefully because later on, you'll actually find that there is a way to, of sorts, uh, solve this. But we're not going to worry about it right now. We, have to, we would have to start getting into imaginary numbers, which is a whole nother ball game. So we won't worry about that right now. For right now, we will just say that there is no solution. But don't call me a liar later when we do actually figure out a way to somewhat solve this. Okay? Excellent. All right, so let's just try a couple more here. We'll clear the screen here, uh, make it a little bit less messy. Um, we've talked about the uh, square root. We've talked about the cubed root. We could also have the fourth root. So maybe we'll just start making a list here. We have like the square root of four, that's equal to two. The cubed root of eight, that's equal to two as well, actually. What about the fourth root? How about the fourth root of 16? Okay, so here again, and I actually kind of made that number a little bit big. These indices are usually pretty small. There we go. So the fourth root of 16. So what number, again, what does this mean? This means that we're asking what number raised to the fourth power in this case is going to be equal to 16. Okay, and again, if we think about this for a little bit, we can decide that, oh, it's a 2, because 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 is, in fact, 16. So 2 is the number hiding behind this question mark. So the square root of 16, or excuse me, the fourth root of 16 is going to be equal to a 2 as well. You can kind of see this pattern I'm doing here. I'm tending to make them all equal to 2. But we wouldn't need to do that. We could do other things as well. <clears throat> For example, I might, I might say, what's the fourth root of 81? And the fourth root of 81 happens to be a 3. So there you go. Now I've switched it up. We don't have all 2s now. Okay? Uh, so, again, these indices over in the corner indicate what the power should be for the number uh, that should be raised to get this radical or this radicand inside the radical. Okay? So hopefully that makes sense to you. Now, one thing I'm going to point out here, let's give ourselves some room. We talked about this one saying that it could also have the answer of a negative 2, right? Could have either one of those. All right? The third root, we said, nope, can only have one answer. The fourth root can actually have two answers again, because another solution would be a negative 2. And to show that, let's take a negative 2 and multiply it by itself four times. And what happens? Negative 2 times a negative 2 is a positive 4, times a negative 2 is a negative 8, times a po negative 2 is a positive 16, which is what we're looking for. So negative 2 would also be a solution. Okay. So we have two answers again. How about if we go to the fifth root? And let's get rid of this guy and throw in a fifth root. Um, so we'll say the fifth root of, whoops, of 32. The fifth root of 32. Well, that happens to be a 2. All right, sticking with my 2s here. So 2 times itself, 5 times, is going to be a, equal to a 32. Now, is there only one solution? I will tell you, yes, there is only one solution. If I were to go to the 6th root, the 6th root of 64, all right, what would that be? Well, the answer again is 2, but it's also a negative 2. It could be either one. Are you seeing a pattern here? Hopefully you are. Hopefully I've done enough of these to show you the pattern. If you look at it, and remember, there is the invisible 2 right here, okay? If you look at this, uh, this list here, we see that it's going every other. In fact, 
anytime this index is even, we have two answers. So two is an even number, we had a positive two and a negative two. Four is an even number, we had a positive two and a negative two. Six is an even number, we had a positive two and a negative two. So anytime the indice, or index, I should say, the index is positive, no, excuse me, anytime the index is even, oh my goodness, I must be getting tired. Anytime the index is even, we could say that there's always going to be two separate answers, a positive answer and a negative answer. If the index is odd, there will only be one answer, only one, okay? So let's write that down. That's kind of important. So index is even, oh my goodness, is even therefore by the way this symbol this this kind of this equal sign with the arrow on it uh, is another way of writing therefore so um, index is even therefore two solutions one positive and one negative. Okay. Uh, if the index is odd, then we've got one solution. And remember this one could be positive, it could be negative, depending upon what's what's the radicand. Okay, so these two points here are important. So make sure these are, are down in your notebook. And if you, it's always good to throw examples in your notebooks too. So I would say underneath this, you know, give an example. Throw in there, the square root of four is equal to a positive two or a negative two, okay? And then down here you could say the cubed root of eight. Cubed root of eight is equal to just a two, okay? And actually, just to kind of cover all my bases here, oftentimes when we're talking about um, a solution like this that could be positive or negative, number the numbers being the same, we can often rewrite these a little bit faster as plus or minus two, okay? So you'll see this periodically. Actually, I think you'll start to see it in the next uh, couple of lessons and maybe even some of the pages today, the seat work. You see this plus or minus two. All that means is we, we have two choices here. One's a positive choice, one's a negative choice, okay? Which actually leads me to my next thing here. Let's talk about that. So if I have six plus or minus two, if they give you this and say, you know, evaluate, or simplify, right? Um, how would you do it? Well, you would have to set this up as two problems. You would say, okay, well, this is six plus two, and this is also six minus two. And six plus two is equal to eight, and six minus two is equal to four. So the evaluation of this expression is going to be eight comma four, all right? meaning that there are two different answers, one for the plus sign, one for the negative sign. So whenever you see an expression that has this plus or minus in it, just know that you better end up with two answers because you're gonna have to do one uh, evaluation with the positive two and then one evaluation with the negative two. So dead giveaway, should have two answers if you see this plus or minus here. All right, very good. All right, and then there is one more thing that they might ask you to do, and that is to kind of estimate the uh, solution to a radical, to a root, uh, without the use of a calculator. So, for example, what happens if I have something that looks like this? The square root of 24, okay? And I want you to give me an estimate of what this might be without using a calculator. All right. Well, the best way to do this is to think about, you know, numbers that you are familiar with. 
And if you think about this, you might recognize that, okay, I don't know what the square root of 24 is, but I do know what the square root of 25 is. Okay, the square root of 25 is a five. Okay, and I do know what the square root of uh, 16 is. The square root of 16 is a four. So notice I, I've just upped it. I've gone from a four to a five. So really what you wanna do is think in your head of, you know, um, all these squared numbers that you can think of. So kind of go through your list. You know, three squared, well, that's nine. Uh, four squared, well, that's 16. Five squared, well, that's 25. Six squared, well, that's 36, right? So you kind of think about all these squares, and then you're trying to find where 24 falls in those squares, okay? And 24 kind of falls, you know, right between these two, doesn't it? Yeah, 24 would be somewhere in here between the 16 and the 25. So it's somewhere be between 4 squared and 5 squared, which means it's somewhere between the square root of 16 and the square root of 25. You following me here? Now, you might say that, okay, the square root of 24 is obviously going to be closer to the square root of 25 than it would be to the square root of 16. So I could say that the square root of 24 is approximately you know slightly something you know something less than or actually maybe I don't even need to put approximately I could say that 20 the square root of 24 um, is equal to something less um, less than you know the square root of 25 which is equal to you know something that's less than 5 so it's less than five, but yeah, I'm gonna back up. I don't like that either. Okay, so then I could say that the square root of 24 is going to fall somewhere between four and five. So it's gonna be equal to something between four and five. Five. I, I could even throw in here, uh, it will be closer to the five. Okay, because uh, 24 is closer to 25, thus closer to five, the square root of 24 is closer to five, than it is to a 16, which the square root of 16 is four. So the square root of 24 is going to be between 4 and 5, but closer to 5. All right, that's kind of how you could estimate uh, square roots. So if I gave you, you know, what's the square root of 10? Go ahead and give me an answer on that. Pause the video if you need to and give me an answer that would be an approximate without the use of a calculator. All right, so we know that you know, again, if I kind of refer to my numbers up here, I could say that the 10 falls, maybe we'll go a different color, a 10 falls somewhere right in here, right? Between the 9 and the 16. So it's going to be between a 3 and a 4, bottom line. Uh, the square root of 10 uh, will be between a 3 and a 4, between, uh, if I could write, it would help, between uh, a 3 and a 4, but closer to which one? Which one would it be closer to? The three or the four? Well, we're talking about a 10. And is a nine, or is a 10 closer to a nine or is a 10 closer to a 16? Well, a 10 is closer to a nine, so it's closer than to the three. But closer to three. So that would be my answer. Okay, so they may throw a couple of problems like this at you uh, as well. Maybe just to kind of round things off, I'm going to give you a couple expressions here and see how you do. I know they're going to be giving you some things similar to this in the book. So let's just try a couple. If I have the expression negative 3 plus, um, I don't know, plus negative 2 squared uh, plus or minus the square root of 25. And they might tell you to evaluate this expression. This is similar to the one that we just did. Why don't you go ahead and pause the video 
and try this one on your own and then we'll do it together. All right, so pretty straightforward. We have our negative three plus negative two raised to the second power. Well, that is going to be a negative two times a negative two, which is a positive four. So a positive, positive four is just gonna be a positive four. And now we have to do this twice. We have to do this with a plus square root of 25 is five. But then we also have to do this whole problem all over again with a minus five. Okay, we have to accommodate for this plus and minus five. So the first expression is going to be negative three plus four is a one, one plus five is six. And the second expression is going to be negative three plus four is one, minus five is going to be a negative four. Okay, so my solution then is going to be six comma negative four. There it is. All right, very good. All right, now the only other thing that they might throw at you here is they might uh, give you a nasty radical. They might give you the square root of two, for example, and they might say, um, give me the answer to the square root of two to the, you know, maybe they want it to the nearest thousandth, okay? Or they might say, you know, um, round, round off to the third decimal place. Okay, they might, might say something like this. Um, either one of these is fine. You would need a calculator to do this, though. So if they ask you to calculate the square root of 2, again, either by rounding it or to the nearest thousandths, either one, it's just a different way of saying the same thing, um, you will need to use a calculator to solve this. Because square root of 2 is, in fact, an irrational number. And hopefully you recall from the last lesson that an irrational number is a decimal number that goes on for infinity and never repeats itself. And never repeats itself. So, in other words, I could say, give me the square root of 2 and I want 100 decimal points places after it. That's a nasty number. Nasty number. Um, in fact, it would be this number right here. I just throw this in. There you go. There is the square root of 2 with 100 decimal places after it. And if you look at this, if, if you really wanted to look at it and look for a pattern, you would not find a pattern in this long list of numbers. And this is just to 100. I could do it to 200 or 300 or 3 million decimal places if I wanted to, and they would never be repeating. Pretty, pretty amazing, actually, that there would never be a pattern in there that would be repeating. Okay, so there you have it. That would be the square root of 2 to the hundredth decimal point. Now, if I wanted to do it to the third decimal place, well, then that would just be 1.414, right? Because I would go to the third decimal place, that would be this guy, look to the next one, the 2, is that 5 or more? And if so, then I would up this 4 to a 5. Or if it's less than 5, I keep the 4 where it is. In this case, it's less than 5, so I keep the 4 where it is. This would be my answer. <clears throat> All right. And that would be the same thing if they asked for the nearest thousandth, because this is the thousandths decimal place. Okay, if I said, give me the, the answer to this, uh, to the nearest, or to, you know, uh, with six decimals. Give me the answer to the square root of 2 and provide six decimals. Well, then the answer would have to be, and maybe I'll just clean up some of this real quick, we'd have to find the six decimal place, which would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So this is our six decimal place right here, this 3. We'd look to the next number. The next number is a 5, so that means we're going to increase the 3 by one digit, and we're going to end up with 1.414214. So I have six decimal places, and I've rounded that uh, 3 to a 4. Okay? Excellent. Well, I think that pretty much wraps up everything that we need to get through to today. Uh, we will be talking more about these um, radicals later on. Um, in, in, especially when we start working them into equations and whatnot. But I think this should probably do us uh, for today. So good luck on the seat work. 
and I will see you tomorrow.